One of the big secrets uh, of, uh, of embellishing uh, gun steel has been uh, damascene. A lot, of per a lot of people have heard about it and don't really know really what it is. And until I took a class from, uh, uh, from Ken Hunt, I didn't know anything about it either. But uh, the damascene, if I can get somebody to uh, get me my over and under shotgun there. Okay, damascene is, is really overlay as opposed to inlay. And, and damascene, uh, the overlay is kind of a misnomer because it does, it does go into the steel. But it only goes into the steel maybe a half a thousandth. Where when you're doing uh, flush gold inlay and either using wire or uh, sheet, you might have a, a sheet that's uh, maybe, uh, or wire, maybe, eh, maybe ten thousandths thick or whatever. And, and you're knocking it down into a ten thousand crevice or a six thousand or six thousand uh, or crevice. And, and so you're, it, it, it's like, it's, it's like an iceberg. The larger part of the iceberg is under the water and you don't see it. And that's, that's anchoring the, uh, the inlay. Uh, so a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the gold is actually being, uh, wasted, uh, using as an anchor. Uh, when you do damascene, uh, like I said, you, you go into the, uh, uh, into the prepared surface by maybe a half a thousandth. Uh, give you that. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> the other side's got to be finished by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't have to take so much home with me, would I? Uh, what I've got here, I've got uh, uh, this is this is damascene, and uh, uh, this I started off uh, with a about a four and a half thousandth button of uh, of sheet silver, and it's it's fine silver. Uh, it's been uh, uh, annealed so it's soft and and I prepared the uh, surface as per Ken Hunt's instructions and you need to do them exactly the way he says or he gets upset anyway uh, I've got I've got some uh, practice plates and I could I could do or I could show you some things on the practice plates but I, th I think with the equipment that I've got when you pound it in place, there's too much give. And so this is a piece of, of pretty thick steel and it won't give. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you uh, a couple methods of, uh, of overlay. This is a I'm going to start off with the crosshatch cross hatch method. And what you do, your tool, like in this case, is it's just a, a, a Glendo blank. Uh, and then I've, uh, I've sharpened it down to this consistency, come to a very sharp point, and then, uh, and then I've rounded the end. And the uh, very end is, is the, uh, the part that's going to do the, uh, the cutting. So your corners are, you've knocked the edge off of the corners as you round it, correct? Uh, it's not yes. sharp all the way along the arc. So it's kind of got a... It, it, it is sharp all the way around the arc, about like so. Okay. But, and it's, but it's rounded on top. Right? It's rounded on top. And that whole nose or bull nose is very sharp. Okay. And, and the, uh, the method is, and I hope it works out all right because... Uh, Everybody likes to be a success when they're demonstrating something, but every once in a while things go wrong. And so I'm just kind of interjecting that now. 
anyway, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a series of cuts using this tool that I've just shown you. Yep. And what are you cutting, the steel or the fine silver? This is steel. You tilt it. I noticed you're yeah, tilting it. Yeah. And, and actually what I'm doing, when you tilt this, you're actually making one half of a dovetail. You're making something so that the, uh, the gold or, or silver, whatever your, uh, whatever your metal is, can flow down into it. Uh, but it needs to be something pretty soft. Uh, I, I've never tried copper with it yet. I've only uh, tried uh, gold and silver. Uh, silver wants to work harden uh, very quickly. And, and so it's not as easily to, or easy to work with as gold is. So uh, let me continue with, uh, with putting these lines in. Okay, I've, I've made a, a set of lines uh, going in one direction, one, one parallel to the next. Okay, now what I'm going to do is go around the other way, and I'm going to put another set of lines. So that's making a dovetail. At 90 degrees, each other? In, you, no, uh, actually, yeah, maybe a 45 or so. Are you cross, cross hatching it? Two different, yeah. I'm going two different directions with this. Between a 30 and a 45, then? Yeah. Doesn't matter really, because what you're going to end up doing is you're going to put another set in. You want, yeah, with a third with a third set of lines. Like a uh, Florentine finish, right? I don't know what that is. It's that Forty-five, so that they're not at right angles. True. But all you're doing is, is you're setting, you're just setting up a background uh, so that it'll receive the gold. Yep. You know, and with a little bit of luck, this will work. The cuts are not real deep, are they? No, but you you try to get them deep. Okay, there you are. Is that an old dentist burr that you're... Pardon me? Is that an old dentist burr that you're working with? No, no, what I'm working with is uh, actually a, a, a Glendo uh, bit uh, that I've Did sharpened in this. Yeah, yeah. So do you, you must do an area bigger than the actual finished yeah. animal. Yeah, yeah. In fact, what you may do is you may do a whole area uh, and then apply the uh, the gold, and I'll and I'll give you a couple methods of doing that. What uh, what Ken Hunt does is he takes his gold, and the uh, and usually he works with a a gold that's a little bit thinner than mine. I uh, I prefer around four and a half thousandths, and he works with uh, uh, with gold that's uh, uh, that's about one and a half thousandths. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Not really. What I've done is, this is sheet gold that I rolled down to around four and a half thousandths. I've got my own uh, rolling mill. Pardon me. You know what? I don't. I don't know what gauge. Uh, I've. Uh, I was a machine repairman, and everything was done by the thousandth. In fact, my boss has told me that too. Yeah, 28 is, is that 15, about 14 or 15 thousandths? I think it's right around 15. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do, what, or like Ken Hunt would do. Do you roll your gold from shot, casting shot? No, no, no. I, uh, usually what I do is uh, I'll take my scrap gold and I'll, I'll uh, take my Burnsmatic torch. And I'll uh, I'll heat it into a into a uh, into a button, and then I'll I'll crush that button a little bit while it's still uh, hot. Uh, it, it, if it's uh, too hot, it'll splatter. But I try to make it I try to make a flat button out of it. That's that's what I'm trying to do. And then after I've got it close to that, 
then I start I start putting it through my rolling mill and uh, and taking it down to where I want it. Uh, when you when you put uh, even 24 karat gold, which is uh, uh, pure gold, through a rolling mill, it'll still work harden. A lot of people uh, find that uh, kind of odd, but uh, it'll still work hard. Well, casting shot would be about the same thing, 24 gold casting shot, right? You put a little button and then just flatten it down yeah. and get through your mill. Yeah, but what I do is I make it larger because I don't want to fool around with a very small piece each time. Yeah. I'd rather roll out a, yeah. a decent size, but uh, even better that, than that is, is actually... Uh, Could you use a wire? Yeah. Yeah, but the wire, won't, you'll end up with, a, let's say, a 25,000th piece of wire, you'll end up with a sheet only about, maybe about this wide. Okay. Well, the, probably the cheapest uh, 24 karat gold you're going to find is to buy yourself the, the smallest panda coin, or the smallest Canadian yeah. coin, because they're 999 fine. All the other coins in the world got a little copper in them, and they're not 24 karat right from the factory. You say Canadian? Canadian. It's maple leaf. 24 karat gold? It's yeah, it's the best nine, there is. Nine, nine, nine. Yeah. Canadian maple leaf. Well, you wind up paying about the same amount of dollars per. You're probably paying more to have it processed at a, at a refinery. To, to order it from Hoover and Strong, you're going to pay more for that than you would yeah, to go yeah. to a coin shop and buy, buy yeah. the smallest. Maple leaf. I've, I've rolled out some uh, the small maple leaf uh, before, and you can. I mean, and it, it'll start out, and you'll end up with a piece about like this, real fine, about that wide. Okay, now I'm going to interrupt you a little bit. Uh, anyway, I'll tell you what. If you'd like, I'll I'll answer some questions right now. Okay, uh, I'm going to move along. Uh, what I'm doing here uh, is I'm taking some cellophane tape and I'm actually going to pick up my piece of gold and I'm, and I'm going to place it into the area that I just uh, cross-hatched. Uh, Ken Hunt usually uses uh, one, one sheet of, uh, of tape. Uh, I, I usually use two to three. Uh, he cuts his designs out uh, with scissors and, uh, and puts them in place. And uh, what I usually do is I'll use a, I'll take a block of wood like this uh, and, and I'll actually uh, cut my whole design out and, and place the whole design into place and, and, uh, and tamp it into place rather than use one little part here and one little part there to make the hole. I just do the whole thing all at one time. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, take a, a brass punch uh, with just a small rounded uh, front and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pound that down into that cross hatching right through the tape. Right and what the tape does, it actually uh, acts as a, as a soft uh, vehicle to push it further down into the uh, cross hatching. Uh, and if I'm lucky, it'll, it'll stick. It's and if, punch, pardon me? Punch frosted, is the face of that frosted? Is it no, no, it doesn't have to be. Because you're going to, yeah, you're going to be going through the tape anyway. Not as a rule. No, just pretty well straight down. Okay, after I've got it down to that point, then I'll I'll use my uh, my brass punch, just kind of naked against it. And the last part of this is I'll use a burnishing tool. Press it the rest of the way in. And another thing it does too is it pushes the edges down uh, at an angle so you, you can't get underneath it. And, and to, uh, to test it, what you do is you take your tape and you try to pull, you try to pull the, uh, uh, the gold off. Uh, take a screwdriver. Pardon me? 
Just a tape, no screwdriver. You got that right. <laughs> no, what, at what point in your engraving process do you do this part of it? Uh, this is, usually I do overlay in areas that, that I can't get into uh, with doing inlay. And another thing too is, uh, I don't like to do uh, deep inlay work in an area that, uh, uh, that, let's say a chamber of a shotgun or something like that, or a cylinder where, you know, it's questionable about uh, uh, knocking a, a ten thousandth hole in it. But most of the steels today, uh, it'll take it without, without it blowing up. But it, this, is just a, uh, this is just kind of an added feature. It works for me. Uh, but now I'm in a, I'm in a, uh, a position of being able to, to engrave around the area that I've, uh, that I've just done. This isn't any special design or anything. What's the geometry of the graver? Just a 90 degree? This one is probably probably 110, 120, somewhere around there. No, this is an anglet. But you know, when you get to the very point, yeah, it's probably about 120. And the reason I use an anglet rather than uh, a straight-sided chisel is that uh, when you're uh, when you're engraving one uh, scroll and it's going up against another uh, with a square graver, you 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 start to scoop out part of the next uh, the uh, next scroll. But this this allows you to get closer to the uh, to the scroll without removing so much of the adjoining scroll. You will a little bit. Uh, there's a way of getting around that, and that's where the two scrolls meet. You put your engraving tool right where they touch, and you and you cut away from the uh, uh, from the area. And you go around and you do the same thing, and that allows both those cr scrolls to kiss without putting a line across them if you want to do that. Uh, you, you can come back and, and use a bellino uh, to indicate the rest of your scroll if you want to do it that way. But uh, this is one method of, of damascene. Okay, another, uh, the other method of, uh, of damascene is when I find the tool, as you see I've got a few. But I've also got more at home. Pardon me. Is the one you need at home. That's a good. That's a good. Good way of getting out of it, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I no. I'm. I'm quite sure it's here. All I'm looking for is. Uh, uh, I've got a little bit of a. A uh, little bit of a punch, and uh, uh, when I was getting ready to to leave. Uh, uh, there was some turmoil in the house, and and uh, I went uh, went away uh, without remembering quite everything. But here it is. Okay, this method uh, is I'm doing actually pretty much the same thing. You're cutting individual teeth now, Joe. Or yeah. Okay, what I'm doing right now. Is I'm taking this uh, very pointed uh, scribe, and I'm actually uh, putting little little dents in it, or in the steel, using that point. And and the uh, the same method holds true. Okay, I've 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 done that at this angle. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this 180. And I'm going to put some more, some more dots in. The opposite angle of the ones I just put in. Then I'm going to go around 
and I'm going to do a third side. It might it makes a pretty uh, fine pattern. Then I'm going to do the same as I did uh, with the tree or with the uh, previous piece. I'm going to take a small piece of uh, of 24 karat. Cut that off, and I'm going to do. I'm going to. I, I'm going to pretty much do what I what I did the first time. I've placed the gold over the area. Uh, actually, the uh, easier way of doing it is uh, picking up the gold with the tape and then moving the tape around. But I didn't do it that way. About four and a half, yeah, four and a half to. If you if you err, I like to err on the uh, the thicker side. It won't make an awful lot of difference. Yeah, if you went to six or seven, then uh, then you're starting to get a little bit thick, and it's gonna uh, it may squash out and and not push down into the uh, uh, into the crevices if you go to a if you go to actually if you go to a, uh, a thicker gold then your cross hatching and the rest of the stuff should be uh, should be deeper it'll take it but it needs to be deeper no no and and unless you unless you want to get up something that uh, that looks more dimensional you know more sculpted uh, you don't waste the extra gold. Okay, I'm going to go through the same method again. Yeah, yeah, like the, uh, the over and under, uh, I was able to, you know, uh, not only go over a curved surface, but if you notice, uh, the gold also crosses the, uh, the barrel, uh, or from the action and into the barrel, and you're able to, to open the gun uh, also, and that was that was a bit of a chore. I'm trying to I'm trying to tell you how difficult this is, so you can say, God, he did that. Jeez, he, he just he just wonderful. Yeah. Pardon me. Pretty much, yeah. All your dimensional stuff also. Uh, there's 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 a couple things on there. the the lines uh, the line work are, is actually inlaid. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, in fact I'll I'll kind of uh, I'll tell you one other area, but I can demonstrate it by didn't come up. So uh, I'm in clean. I hope. Okay, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to burnish it. Now, is that second piece right next to the first piece? No. Go right on. See, there's one in one corner done one way, and you can and you can see the cross hatching in the other in the other part. You want to pass it around? Hey, Joe, when those backgrounds are like you. Damn, seen in the background and they beat those. Are they setting that with the beating punch? Or are they punching it in first and then beating? It? All of it is setting. The when you use the initial tape, that's setting it for the first time. I mean, like when, when it's in a relieved background, like in the background on your. Okay, camera. go ahead. Okay, when that's when that thin foil is set down in that background, the surface around it is raised, mm -hmm. and then that background is beaded, bead punch. What I okay? Get that beaded texture back there. Well, uh, th that's uh, that's a special situation, and it was something that I that I uh, kind of alluded to by saying that there's a couple other things that I would show you. And this is when you when you've got a an area uh, uh, that you've you've excavated, 
and and maybe it's uh, maybe it's eight or ten thousandth, or it can be any depth that's different than the surrounding area. Uh, what you do in a, in a case like that. Uh, you can use this punch method and it works very well. Uh, the, uh, uh, the other method of cutting, that's harder because you're going to hit the wall of the adjacent uh, or the, uh, the higher piece. But once you've, uh, once you've taken your sheet gold and you take a, a, a piece that's just a little bigger than the cavity that you want to put it in and you, you put it in that area and, and I use a, a very special uh, uh, a very special, sophisticated uh, punch that I can't find, but uh, what it is, I take a chopstick and I cut it about this, about this long, and I round it off, and I use the chopstick to set it. And I also... Uh, bamboo. They're all, yeah, they're almost always bamboo. Pardon me? I didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I've also got I've got some plastic punches uh, that I use too, and, and it's a very resilient uh, plastic, and it acts a lot like the chopstick does. Okay, after I've used the soft punch to get it in place, then I come back in uh, with a uh, with a uh, a brass punch uh, with a flat nose on it, and then I I further. Uh, flatten that area down, uh, and and so you've got you've got some pieces of gold that are coming up the sides of the walls. Okay, that's that's really easy to get rid of. All you do is you take a you take a knife like this, and you just carve into this area. You bring it in, and you just just pull the gold off. It's very easy to do. No, uh, if, if I prefer uh, both of them because there's areas that that is perfect for or is unique for one and another that's unique for the other. Uh, uh, in areas that uh, uh, that I might come up against something else or something, it, maybe there's some existing uh, engraving and I don't want to uh, scratch across my existing or existing grave engraving, then I might use the uh, dot method. And, and, uh, and if, you, if you want the surrounding area uh, that you're going to damascene, if you want it nice and clear, you can't use the, the uh, scratch method because it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave a crosshatch beyond the, uh, the scroll. Uh, but if you use the dot method, and, and let me digress a little bit, when I, like the, uh, the barrels, uh, I drew, uh, I drew the uh, scroll work on the barrels uh, with the same pencil I use the rest uh, that I've used for the other. Okay, then, then I've cut my design in with a single line all the way around the perimeter. So I've, now I've got a line, an incise line, going around uh, the, the leaves and tendrils. Okay, then, now I'm going to take my, my little punch, uh, the, you know, the sharp punch, and I'm going to go all around the inside of that leaf, three different directions. And then I'm going to take the uh, uh, the sheet gold, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to now I'm going to pick a, pick it up with some uh, with some tape, a couple layers of tape. I'm going to put it where I want it, and I'm going to tape it down. And this piece this piece will be larger than the uh, than the scroll that I'm trying to to uh, damascene. Okay. Then and I usually use an extra uh, layer of tape. Uh, when you go over that and start to punch it in, all at once your design starts to come up through the sheet gold. So now you can see where the perimeter of your, uh, of your gold is, and you can take a knife and remove all the access, and then come back and do the, uh, uh, the final punch work, and then also the, uh, the final burnishing. Uh, and, then, uh, and then I go over that, usually with a, about a 600 grit uh, wet or dry paper. Uh, so that I've got a uh, I've got a surface that I can draw on, so I can detail it. Uh, 
lot of other tips on that. If you're doing a, a piece where you're going to do a lot of scroll work and you want to, you can use the same kind of leaves again and again. Make a punch, yeah, that shape, and yep. stamp out the gold. Or else, get if you're going to do it on lots of different jobs, have a uh, make a plate for a pantograph. And cut them out. Put a sheet of uh, gold onto a piece of plastic. Just cut them out with a pantograph, so you can use the same. Yeah, and that works. That yeah, that works for the uh, uh, for the crosshatch method. What what he's saying is, uh, if you're doing uh, a a couple of areas or a bunch of them uh, that are going to be the same design on each of them, uh, you can make uh, you can engrave a punch uh, so that uh, it may be in the fourth or uh, in the uh, the form of a leaf. Uh, you can punch out your individual piece of gold like one little leaf. You pick it up with a pair of tweezers. You put it where you want it, or the or you use the tape and put it in the area and, and uh, put it down. Uh, I've uh, I changed uh, uh, his method a little bit in that uh, he takes he uses a leaf or whatever, and and maybe he's already started the scroll. Uh, and he's got it in place and now he wants to uh, add a leaf on it. Well, he puts the leaf on it. Well, what I do is uh, the area that I'm going to be working on, the steel area, uh, I uh, prepare the area by swirling it uh, with a six, about a 600 grit uh, wet or dry paper. So now I've, I've given myself uh, an opaque background that I can draw on. And I take my pencil and I draw on it. The neat part of it is you take your cellophane tape and you tape the area and when you pull it off you've got your drawing on the tape. So then you take your sheet gold and you put it on, you put it on a block like this. And then you take your tape that has the image right on it and you put it over the top of it and then you use uh, a, round, a rounded nose cutter like this and you can cut the whole design out at one time. Uh, if, you, if you notice the, uh, uh, the over and under shotgun, uh, it has, there's a, a Greek helmet in there. Well that helmet and all the rest, that whole area was cut out at, at one time and then placed there and then another, another piece of tape put over it and then uh, knocked in place. Uh, Uh, the the uh, uh, the other thing that I was uh, saying, and she alluded to it, was uh, sharpening chisels. Uh, I always thought sharpening chisels uh, was something that was really uh, magic. I thought that gods came out of heaven and and uh, and sharpened chisels for you. And <laughs> but uh, there's. Uh, there's actually uh, three, I, I believe, three main methods of sharpening, or sharpening a chisel. Uh, there's one uh, this, that uh, the uh, Italians use, and, and that, uh, maybe I can use this, but what it is, okay, the uh, the Italians uh, take their they take their chisel and they and they sharpen they put the face on it and then they put a long a long heel on it like this and that heel usually works out to be about 15 degrees and so this this whole area uh, is cut down kind of like this okay. That's the, that's the way the, the Italians do it. Okay, Ken Hunt's method is that he takes his, his tool, he puts, a, he puts a face on it like this, and then, <clears throat> and, and he uses an anglet. He doesn't use a flat-sided uh, chisel. Okay, he goes back in and use, he usually, usually uses a stone. And, uh, and he'll start up towards the upper part of this and he'll take his chisel and he'll roll it. But he, he lets it, uh, he goes slower as it gets towards the, uh, the point. So that the, uh, the point is, it, it's, it's 
there's more sharpening going on there than it is further up on the chisel. And so when you're done and you look at the chisel from the side, you actually see something that looks almost straight up and down. This whole area, and, and it's, of course, it's a, there's an angle now, okay? He sharpens just this point, just that small point, and he wants it, he wants this line right straight up and down. And, and he, uh, he insists on that uh, for, uh, for doing English scroll, and it, it does a great job of it. And I, uh, you know, he, he does English scroll probably as good as, maybe better than anybody. Uh, the, uh, the third method, and, and I've, I've used all of these, but the third method uh, is actually the easiest method, and that's that's kind of of a of a fish bottom thing. And and uh, so it's rounded. And and the uh, the way to sharpen it, if you're sharpening a stone, is you're gonna you're gonna be rolling it. You're first gonna hit the uh, the bottom part. And, and, and get the cuts uh, started, and then you're gonna work up the sides of the, uh, of the bit until you've got it an, into an anglette uh, position. But I don't use a stone. What I use, I've got, I've got one of these power hones, and a, and a friend of mine has got a, he's got a tool and die shop. Actually, he manufactures, uh, uh, lathe bits uh, and they're ceramic so he uses he uses diamond uh, wheels uh, to cut his ceramic bits and he always he and, and I went to his place oh about three years ago and I saw these and he and he was using them uh, to prop up some of his tables the table legs were resting on the inside of these, you know, and, uh, but he told me, he says, you know, he says, uh, Joe, he says, I think I've got something that you need. You know, and I saw him and uh, or saw the, these things under the uh, table legs and, uh, and he said, let me get you a bunch of these. So he gathered up a whole bunch of them. And so uh, this is diamond uh, and you can sharpen carbide on this very easily. Uh, and, and this actually the, is a coarse wheel, and, and this wheel is probably a 2000. So this, this, is, uh, this is finer uh, than most of the uh, stuff that GRS has. And then, uh, and then he gave me a couple of these really fine ones. I have no idea what the grit would be, but I'm guessing they'd be about a 5000 or more. And, and when you, what I do is I sharpen, I sharpen my bits, using the first stone on my power hone. And I, and I get the shape down to where I want it, and then I come back with this, and I touch only the, the belly that comes to the point on the, uh, on the bottom side. I, don't, I, I seldom try to do the face, because if you've got your tool that you've just sharpened off of this one, and you, and you try to place it on this, it, 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 you're making facets all over the place. Seldom do you get the, uh, you know, the, the same angle that you did the first time. Once in a while, you're lucky and it comes out all right. But, you know, in a way, uh, there's some chisels that I actually think are too, are, are too sharp to do particular jobs. If you're, if you're doing a real light uh, detail work, sharp chisel is exactly what you want. But if you're, if you're going down a little bit deep, and you've got some close or close cut curves or something like that, uh, that puts that, uh, that fine point in jeopardy, and usually it goes by the wayside. But what I do is I'll sometimes just kind of touch the point on this, just actually dull it a little bit. And, uh, and it seems to, it seems, the chisel seemed to last a little bit longer. Uh, other than uh, how to succeed at uh, 48 years of marriage, I think this thing's over with. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, so how, how's it going? It's hard work, I'll tell you kids. I don't know if you've ever lurked on the farm or not. I'm about ready to give it up and go into something else. Well, what do you mean? Some kind of related business. Well, what kind of related business would you like to go into? The fertilizer business. 
fertilizer business. Yeah, I think that enough. Picked out a model already. I'm gonna say the number one in the number two business. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Lytton, I'm from England, just outside London. Um, I've been engraving for about 30 something years. Uh, all my working life I've been doing engraving. And uh, worked for, in gun, uh, gun engraving first of all for some of the English gun companies. And uh, since 86 I've been freelance and doing mainly custom knives and silver work, things like that. Uh, How did you ever get started then? I did jewelry, we had a jewelry making uh, class at high school and uh, I went, after I, I loved doing that and I originally wanted to be a jeweller. Um, I went to a college where they, t in London called Sir John Cass College, which is basically a training ground for the um, silversmithing and jewelry trade and they do engraving and I did engraving there and it's just a one year course uh, which is then um, at the end of that, I had to get an apprenticeship. So, and I met somebody who worked for Purdy, per, James Purdy and Sons, who are famous shotgun makers, London uh, Gun Company. And I managed to get an interview and got an apprenticeship with them. Um, I stayed there for about 11 years altogether. Then moved, I emigrated and moved to Canada for a short while. Um, three years I was there. Uh, then went to a company up in Ma uh, Maine, uh, for a year and a half and then in 86 moved back to England and went freelance and started do, do, I do occasional gun bits mainly um, you know the occasional floor plate for a rifle or something like that for a customer but mainly knife work now uh, custom knives Would you mind showing us some of your work? Yes yeah, certainly This is um, a knife by a maker a knife maker called Steve Hole, very well from uh, Arizona, very very good maker. This is typical ink, what we call fine English scroll work. Um, an American Eagle, uh, basically uh, it's a Winston Churchill design, which uh, I particularly liked. English scroll on, on you know at the top and bottom, on the reverse the eagle head, with uh, more English scroll. Thank you. And then um, another knife here. I work for, a, as I say, I do mainly custom knives now. This is a maker from Minnesota, I think he is. Um, Gene Shadley, Eugene Shadley. Slip joint folder, jig bone, and again with English scroll on the, bol on the bolsters. And I'm, I do other styles as well, but I'm known for doing the, the English scroll. Uh, I think some people get a surprise when they see uh, when I've done some, uh, something different from that, but I try and, uh, try and do quite a few different si types of scroll. I do a lot of silver work. Uh, yeah, I do quite a lot of silver work, uh, pill boxes, snuff bottles or boxes and some jewelry pieces. I'll show you another little jewelry piece I made here. It's a pendant, but I used a, a buckle blank to do the pendant, um, so it's sterling silver again. I engrave it, then pierce out the background. It gives a nice effect for um, when you wear it, uh, and it's just the background's inked with uh, antique black from uh, just a, a type of ink you paint on, and um, it's come with a chain. I'd, just like doing this, it's some, a bit different uh, from the just doing knives makes a change. And but um, I'd say probably 90% of my work is on is on custom knives. Now. My name is Kurt Horvath, and I am from Fayetteville, Tennessee. Uh, how, how long have you been engraving firearms? I've been engraving since 1972. Started when I was 14 years old, almost 52, and it's all I've ever done. Professional engraver, 
since 1983. Went to school in uh, Colorado, gunsmithing school for two and a half years, and spent four years in Belgium and Italy. So, what's your expertise? Uh, firearms engraving, also mostly shotguns. I do mostly shotguns. I do a few uh, high-grade hunting rifles, but pretty much I stay along with shotguns. Uh, the belt buckle was just a favor to a friend, but uh, that's my expertise is mainly trap and skeet shotguns. Uh, how did you get? How did this career come about? I'm sorry. How did this career come about? Oh, uh, believe it or not, a strange man worked for my father. Did it as a hobby. And uh, I got interested uh, working in my dad's shop after school, in uh, high school, and uh, just picked it up and ran with it. And never looked back. And that belt buckle that you just uh, took a picture of probably has mm, close to 200 hours, and maybe two ounces of gold in it. It's a $5,000 belt buckle. So, you know, it's just not, not everybody. I mean, I don't have one. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's expensive. You, the rifles and the shotguns I do average forty to sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, and it's just not the everyday guy who's going to, you know, buy a firearm like that. Uh, average time for one of my jobs anymore is probably running seven, eight hundred hours easy, and that's, that's the low end. I've got one rifle now. I've probably got on and off three years into it, I've got over 2,000 hours in it. So, and how much time does it take? It depends on how much you want to spend, really. You know, so that's, that's pretty much the only answer I can give you for that. Uh, this is Jim Hall. He is using a fast draw gun and uh, it is made specially for shooting wax bullets and what he's doing right now, there's a single action revolver, and he... You can see what he did. Slow motion. <laughs> yeah, I've got slow motion. Now I'm getting slower. Wax, when you shoot it, it messes up your garage. This stuff here, it don't mess up your garage. What is it? It's wax. Peelable wax. Well, it's got, I get it out of Canada. It took me three or four years to, to get it, get them to mix it for me. Because we shoot it in my workshop and it makes a mess. When you're shooting wax, it just, you know. Next thing you know, it's in the ceiling and everywhere else. And this stuff here just hits and falls it's, off. This, this gun made in the 50s, you know. Is that three-screen three screw ruler? Yeah. yeah. It's made in the 50s, early 60s. They said, you take a, a good gun and ruin it. I said, no, I take a gun now that, that you can make it work. In original condition, this gun was probably worth five, 600 at best. I sell this gun 1400 tomorrow. Mm -hmm. To a fast draw guy. You find the ruler's the best gun for fast oh, it's, draw? Yeah, it's, it's the most durable, strongest. Yeah. 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 Coat, the coat, you don't, you don't do that to a no, coat. It breaks. Yeah. Both can't handle it. Yeah. Then, yeah. It breaks it. See, we do a lot of stuff now. Adolf is making a, you've seen that yeah, piece. Adolf was showing me yeah, what he was doing. Well, yeah. see, I, I put a, I put a piece in this gun to strengthen it and to stop it from breaking. Yeah. Like when this, when the ceiling latch comes up, uh, I got a, I got a block in there that that rubs against to keep from breaking off. Keep it from, from snapping, yeah. Yeah. So when Adolf started making these parts, you know, he makes a hammer now, and he makes some triggers, and then he started building the whole gun. Well, uh, we got a block in there now that he catches in there, that we don't have to make that block. So it makes a whole new frame for you. Yeah. 
Fisco Ruger frame. Yeah. yeah. But he makes he makes any part about anything I need. You know, he's he's one of them jip jip. Uh, yeah. I got a I got lathes and milling machines, and if he comes out and he catches me working on something, oh Jim, give me that. So, <laughs> I, I can do that. I can go jip jip and do that. So I said, here you go. <laughs> well, I remember the world's uh, old high fast draw and American fast. Old fast draw, yeah. yeah. I'm, I used to be the vice chairman of the World Fast Drive. I won the world in 2001 uh, as an old man in, area, yeah. in my area, Area 1, which was seven states. So that wasn't bad to be an old guy, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, I, I make fun of them now. Uh, I had knee surgery two, here a while back, and I lost two years of work. I had a lot of trouble, blood clogs, this and that. But anyway, I didn't shoot for two years. So they talked me into going to Georgia. Uh, four weeks ago, and I didn't want to go because I hadn't been shooting and I hadn't even picked up a gun. So I, I went and so where'd you go for what? The, uh, to, to a match in Georgia. Oh, a fast draw match? Yeah. Okay. And there was like 40 people there. So I, I got there and I'm, I'm like, you guys engraving, I couldn't do nothing but shoot. So I shot and won the thing. Right. And then I go to, to, go to Kentucky week four last and I come in fifth. And I missed. Now it was a real tight shoot, but I, it was 47 shooters. What I done is I missed in two days. I missed one target, and then I missed my hammer. When I when I come out, I missed my hammer, half cocked the gun, uh -huh. so I had to recover. And I shot with like 6,800th of a second on the recovery shot, but I still lost. I went down to from like first down to fifth. Just Tell me your name. Where you're from? I'm Jim Hall. I'm from Evansville, Tennessee. Uh, my alias is a Tennessee gunfighter. Uh, you know, we go all over the country and shoot, Ohio, Florida, uh, Georgia, just anywhere, Kentucky, uh, shooting competition fast draw. How long have you been doing this? Well, uh, about, I don't know, 15 years, I guess so. How in the world did you ever get into this? Well, I've always liked to shoot full guns, and I seen this one day, and I said, hey, I got to try this. And then you know, when I tried it, I'm hooked, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it's just, you can't get over it. You just keep on shooting. And, I've tried to quit a time or two, and then I'll just start right back up, and, you know. But, you know, it's at my age, I'm 64 years old, so I ain't got nothing else to do. But farm, I do farming too, but uh, this is my hobby, one of my hobbies. If somebody's 64 years old, you're pretty quick. Well, well I hope I hope to stay this fast for a little while longer. <laughs> it gets slowing down. I'm getting authorized in my hands and, and uh, you know, one thing and another. But it's a lot of fun. If somebody wanted to get into this, what would you tell them? Just give me a holler. I'll help you any way I can. Loan you a gun, make you a holster, loan you bullets, or whatever. That's, if you want to shoot, I'll get help you get in it. Where do they uh, have, where, where do they call it when they have competitions? Is there... Well, just, we have, what, our next one will be in Alabama. And uh, it's held up, it's helped by the World, by the American Fast Draw Association. So it's an Alabama State Championship, and it's next weekend. It's Saturday and Sunday next week. And then the next shoot will be at, at my place. It'll be in July the 5th and 6th. And it'll be, it'll be, help, it'll be sanctioned with the Ohio Fast Draw, the Southern Division of the Ohio Fast Draw. And the one in Alabama will be the American Fast Draw Association. So we shoot, we shoot the American Fast Draw, the Ohio Fast Draw, the Ohio Southern Division, which is the Southern, Southern States. And then we even shoot in the World Fast Draw. So the world fast draw is mostly out west, and ours are mostly on, up and down the east coast, and from Florida all the way up to Pennsylvania. But it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, you talk about out west. I mean, people, the average person is used to seeing westerns on TV yeah. where they're, you know, Matt Dillon, he's got the quick draw and stuff. I mean, there's a big difference between that and what you do, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is speed. I mean, it's, it's a simulation of, of walking out the street fast drawing, you know, shooting. Uh, shooting at somebody else, and, and sometimes we do that. We have a we have a walk and draw deal, where you walk at one another and you draw, you know, and shoot. And it, it goes by time, it goes by light, the same as this timer here. And uh, it's, 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 that's where it come from out west. I mean, it just started. People started. But when I was a kid, I fast drawed. You know, that's one I hadn't shot myself with a 22 pistol. Uh, I'd shoot at, a, at an old car body, draw me a picture on it, and I'd shoot 50 times and. You know, that, that to get me another box shell somewhere, but uh, it, that's what I say I got started, and I've always liked to do it. I wish I had got in this when I was a teenager with, with competition, because I had, you know, I was young and had more speed. And, you know, I could have competed better, but 
I compete pretty good. You know, that's, when I go to a match, they, a lot of them really wish they didn't come, you know, because they, they, they got to tighten up if they beat me. So that's, that's the thing about it. It's fun to go when the young guys are shooting and, uh, you know, I can compete with them. And it makes, makes them wonder, I wish he hadn't showed up this time. But, but anyway, most, most of the time it's not how good I've done, it's how bad they've done. You know, they think about the competition. They go reading the scores. You know, they stand at the scoreboard and keep keep the scores. They tally on the score, and I never look at the scoreboard till the game's over. Cause I, every shot I shoot, I shoot the fastest I can. But it's it's a lot of fun. But uh, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, uh, what, how would they go about? Just that? give me a call. Yeah, I'm in I'm in Tennessee, so that's that's four two three six zero five zero eight zero five. Jim Hall. Everybody in my county knows me. And you you look familiar to me. Have you been on TV like we Ripley's Believe It or Not or something like no, that? Before? No, no. Uh, I've had I've had I got horses in Alabama. A trainer trains horses for me, and, and uh, uh, a guy by the name of Phil Sapperton. He's a horse trainer, and he's been training horses for me for 20 years. And uh, so he's had guys. I'd, I'd go down there, and he'd had introduce me to guys. And he'd, the guys look at me like you say, I've seen you somewhere. He said, Oh yeah. I said he he doubled for Robert the Ball. And uh, you know, I had a guy to go get a go get his autograph book and want me to sign it. And I said, don't do me this way, <laughs> you know. But I didn't. I didn't think it looked like Robert Duvall. So, yeah. but you know, he he pulled that stuff on me several times. What do you think of what Scott's the gathering out here? What oh, do you think about is, the this, whole thing? This is nice. You know, was you here last year? No, I wasn't. Well, see, last year uh, I cooked on that big that other cooker. See, I I met Scott wanting to engrave, so I come out and took some lessons and. Uh, he called me one day and he said, what about uh, coming to this thing here? And I said, okay, I'll be glad to. He said, if his wife gets some enough grill, she's going to cook. I said, hey, I got a cooker. So I brought a cooker and we cooked for 50-something people last year. And then this year he said, let's do something different. And I said, well, you know, I'm, I shouldn't have done this. But I said, well, we cook a whole hog. He said, okay, let's do that. And I tried to back out after I said it. And I said, well, you know, he's expecting to cook a whole hog, so we did. And I think it turned out pretty good. Everybody was pleased with the meal. That's I've cooked hogs and I've done that for years too. But it turned out good. I guess one last question, you know, I mean <clears throat> guns have gotten a I mean the misuse of guns yeah. is a terrible thing. Yeah. But this is a I would say a classic example of I think I think on guns if you've got kids, you need to teach your kids about guns. And I raised kids too, I raised four kids. And I've always taught my kid, if you go in a neighbor's house or you go home with a kid and, and one of the kids come out with a gun, if you can't get your hands on it, you get out of there. Because my kids knows the safety of guns and how to handle a gun. You know, my kids don't, they don't, they never bother the gun. I can load a gun, lay it on the table and never bother it, which I didn't, but I could have because they, they respected what the gun would do. And I think, I think a lot of time when kids are hurt, it's a, it's a lack of knowledge you don't know. And I think when people are really against guns, it's lack of knowledge for them too. They don't know. You know, they're scared of something they don't know nothing about. And, and look at it this way. I've been to a lot of, lot of gun fights, been to, been to a lot of shooting matches, and I've never been to a shooting match and a fight start. Now have you, I mean, you, you been to a bar where you got in a, people got in a fight? You know, everybody didn't have a gun. Now if everybody had a gun, you wouldn't see as many fights there because somebody might get hurt. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's my theory of it. But I've never I've never seen a fight at a gun shot at a gun shoot you know shoot match. was written on the walls and window sheet How she'd act the little girl The deceiver don't believe her that's her dream Sometimes the
But women like these, they get by. Everybody found it kind of sad when they found. Still some cried when she died this afternoon. Louise rode home on the nail train. Somewhere to the sound I heard say. Too bad it is. Good night.